so to start off with a really positive message, because I think most of the time when people talk about food, talk about hunger, obesity, there's a lot of negative messaging uh, around it. There's so many issues that are embedded in our food system. There's agriculture, there's health, there's uh, consumption patterns, you know, the, a whole range of issues. But let's, let's just come from a very positive perspective, the, the glass half full. We can feed the world. We can do it right now. Actually, people in Chicago are probably uniquely suited to know that because a lot of the grain that's used to feed the world comes through this city. But the bigger question is, can we feed the world well? And well is a, is a really loaded term, especially in a health conversation. But I think it's really at the essence of what I'm looking at as, as, as this broad field of hunger, obesity, prevention, cure. And it's, it's the fundamental question for all of us, for ourselves, but really for many issues around the world. I became interested in food security issues, well, first because I love food, but second because I saw this connection between global security issues, places around the world that are terrorist hotbeds, and global food security issues. There's an African proverb that, you know, a hungry man is an angry man, and I know that's incredibly true for myself. I'm not really great to be around when I'm hungry, and my husband and everyone around me knows that, so they bring snacks with them. But the reality is, if you look at it at a population level, it's true also. Places around the world that are dealing with chronic, chronic hunger and malnutrition tend to be places, places that are hotbeds of violence. And it's a connection that we need to make when we look at this broader issue of food security in the world. Well, I want to also come from another very positive perspective, which is that food is awesome. And especially for us, you know, when we're struggling with, with, with our own weight and fitting into our pants and all these things, food takes on a lot of negative characteristics. Everywhere around the world, in every single community that we came from, America, our, our, our ethnic heritage, our religion, there is a food-related celebration in every single community. And it's something that we have to remember and something that we don't often think about when we just want to put dinner on the table. But the reality is that celebration of food and that beauty of food is something that we have to bring back in order to really change not only food, but our health. So I was interested in this global picture of security and also was reading at the same time things about what was going on in our own food system. You know, all these issues from obesity to sustainable agriculture, they're very linked. But I started working on hunger and the numbers are pretty dramatic. Especially, to, well today, the, the number seems to be around 850 million people are hungry. In 2008, it was up to a billion people hungry. That is a huge percentage of our world that doesn't have fundamental food security. In America alone, the number is 49 million hungry people. It's amazing to think about that in, this, in, in land of plenty, especially in the communities right around Chicago that do supply so much of our food. The other thing I found interesting, though, in looking at hunger was that the year 1980, which is so often connected to the obesity epidemic, was also relevant to the problem of hunger. So we can see in this chart that although there was a drop in the 90s, we continue to have hung more and more hungry people in a time when we certainly have the technology and we definitely have enough food to feed the world. So the other 1980 problem that I kept seeing was obviously obesity. I, I would travel around the world to visit hungry places and, and provide school meals and come home and see that there's this other food-related issue that's right, right meeting me at the airport when I come back to America. But the fact is, the availability of food was really, really similar. So when you think of the global obesity epidemic, obviously people are eating too much. But we can also reflect on what the food is that people are eating. Everywhere in the developing world, everywhere, in more countries than are recognized by the UN, you can find soda. You can find packaged foods. Often people who are hungry can't afford those things because they can't afford the calories per se. But even people like me who want to eat healthy, you can't necessarily find the food you want to eat pretty much everywhere around the world. The other thing, the 1980 number, and I'm obsessed with that because it was the year I was born, so I took sort of an egocentric approach of looking at the food system. But ironically, it's not just me. In the time that I've been on the planet, these numbers have changed dramatically unless we lived in Colorado. So we should potentially all move there, but it's just a <laughs> weird anomaly. Maybe it's the mountains. Um, but, but the reality is the change in the obesity problem across our country has been dramatic. And like the previous slide showed, it's also spread entirely around the world. But a health factor that's fascinating about this is that as people eat more of our diet, they develop the same health profile as people in the West. 
So if you're talking about a, a person in, in the developing world who's potentially been born into a hungry family, but then eventually has the resources to eat a more Western diet, they will literally develop the disease rates that we do. So it's not just that individual people are lazy or that we as individuals don't have personal responsibility. I think we have to really look at the context of the food system that people are living in that's then leading to these diseases. So when, you have to, when you're looking at food, you're, you're, you're thinking about hunger and obesity, obviously it all goes back to the seed. And it's something that we don't often think about, especially you know, in our daily lives in a big city. We just are not faced with agriculture as part of the equation. But there are really very different pictures of agriculture. There's women farmers around the world who are trying to grow enough to survive. And then there's big grain bins you know, right south of here that are growing massive amounts of corn and soy. And that corn and soy and wheat and the things that are highly subsidized have really become the basis of our modern diet. So changes in agriculture policy in the middle of the last century and then even more so around 1980, things like the, the patenting of genetically modified crops and a shift away from agricultural aid in favor of food aid, those things, along with the development of high fructose corn syrup, have really shifted the diets of the Western world, but also the diets of the developing world. African agricultural production, corn production specifically, has fallen by 14% in, in the last 30 years. So as we've been eating more and more corn in the form of soda and cheap meat and products like that, and even putting it in our cars, we've also in some ways destabilized markets overseas. So the link between hunger and obesity has become much, much more clear. And we can see in our own diet here how it's very, if you're a rational consumer, the choice of calorie per, per dollar is very clear. The cheapest things that you can eat are the, the, the sodas and the corn and soy-based, commodity-based products. And the more expensive things that are harder to access are the fruits and vegetables that we know we should all be eating. And so here's the numbers. The numbers are, are right there in front of us. We've obviously chosen and somehow invested in eating more and more of the foods we shouldn't be eating. And clearly our children are following suit, and we know what the outcomes and health have been because of that. A really interesting fact is that today in America, we know we should fill half our plates with fruits and vegetables, but we couldn't even do that with American-grown produce. Not because these foods can't grow in America, but because that's not the system that we've been promoting. And I argue we have to think about, is this food system, the food production system we have, is it helping us to have a healthier society? Or have we completely disconnected agriculture and health? So in the same way that food and eating is an agricultural act, Agriculture is eventually then a health act. And so the foods that we buy and the choices that we make for ourselves in, in our own dinner table have this massive connection to the overall agricultural system that we're building, and that has a massive connection to the overall health system that we're building. The numbers are so dramatic, and you know we don't even know, aside from maybe correlation, how many different disease patterns and how many different outcome, health outcomes are connected to our diet. Of course, we know that just by obesity alone, we're more prone to die earlier and to have health problems, especially chronic health problems. But I don't think we even know yet how our specific diet that has moved away from fresh fruits and vegetables is causing other health outcomes. We also know that it's been really expensive. And you know, like Dr. Emanuel said, when you look at diets of people that tend to eat in some ways better foods, got to go back to you know, old Europe for as much as we don't want to emulate them in every way, the more traditional diets, think the agricultural systems that are growing more traditional foods, actually are spending less even in these health outcomes. So I argue that if you look at how our food system has affected this global hunger platform and how our food system has affected our, ourselves, really hunger and obesity are much more similar than they are different. Around a billion people hungry, a little less now, thankfully, and are over a billion people overweight. That is a huge percentage of the global population that are dealing with issues that both boil down to food. And if we think differently about how to address those two issues and in building agricultural systems towards a health outcome, we may be able to address both of them in very, very similar ways. To the point today, what we've been doing is trying to address hunger in one way by trying to get people more calories and we've been trying to address obesity in another way, by just telling people that they need to eat less or potentially that they need to eat different food. But the reality is it's the system that we've built that fundamentally needs to change. So I argue, first, the first question in building a new system 
is what are the metrics of that new system going to be? You know, a lot of times, like my first slide suggests, the, met the big metric is do we have enough food? How will we feed the world? But really, when you think of what's really important, are our markets working well? When I think of a real free market in food, the farmer's market is the best example. There's transparency, there's real choice. Farmers are growing directly what the consumers are asking for. That certainly doesn't exist in mega supermarkets that are very disconnected from the, consu the consumer to farmer relationship. But also, is growing food the ultimate goal? Or is it the nutritional yield of that food that helps the population be healthy? That's the metric we should be focused on. We think of food waste, there's 40% food waste in America, and the number's actually quite similar overseas as well. They're often similar, they're, they're, there's waste for different reasons, but some people have been asking, should we consider obesity also a form of food waste? Is that calorie waste and, and, and the food that we're producing that's just going into people's overweight, is that something we should be considering when we're talking about how much food we really need to feed the planet? And then, isn't biodiversity important if we're, if we're pushing people and doctors are telling us to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, but those things are not the ones available? If there's only really two apples at the grocery store, but we might like one of the thousands of other different varieties of apples that maybe taste much better, is, does that matter when we're building an agricultural system that then leads to a health system? And should we be thinking about scale and how we can grow more and more and more and more and more baby carrots on a massive farm, or should we be thinking about how we can grow carrots closer to eaters who all need to be eating carrots all around the world? I also think there's a fundamental question of value. You know, certain parts of the food space have defined value in one way. It's time to maybe de define value in another way. And the value of sitting down to family dinner and eating half your plate with fruits and vegetables has to have merit. We also have to ask new questions about our diet. We, we, we promote meat. We think meat is good. We promote protein. It's a really important part of our diet. The amount that we're producing and the amount that people are eating is not sustainable. And it's certainly not a good health outcome. You know, the old Einstein quote is that you can't do more of the same thing to get a different outcome. And the powers that be want us to grow more food and develop the more industrialized food system around the world so that people can eat like us. But I ask whether or not that is really the right outcome. And we also have to think about who is funding the science and technology to get us the answers we want. Especially in our big universities, many of the studies that don't connect agriculture to health are just looking for an outcome of yield, and that's not a food system that's healthiest for us. We know the data has shown that as we've spent less and less on our food, we've spent more and more on our health care. And we see the populations around the world that have flipped this tend to have better health, health outcomes and healthier food systems too. So I argue there's something we can all do. And it happens every single day. And if we don't think about how we're going to change dinner in our own homes, we can't possibly think of how the rest of the world is going to eat better and have better health outcomes too. I think it's a really important thing to put on ourselves that we have to take power back as eaters. And if we can choose the healthier food that we need in our, for our own selves to fit into our own genes, we can then obviously spread that message to our kids. We can improve the health outcomes of our communities. By demanding high quality food at the stores that we shop, we're improving the health outcomes of our whole neighborhood. And we're also encouraging a healthier agricultural system in our own towns, but all, all around the world by buying out of the system that the powers that be and buying into a healthier agricultural system that feeds people well. There's innovation happening everywhere in the food system. It's just a matter of whether or not that's where we're gonna put our consumer dollar. And I argue that the future does demand us to change. We have the next 30 years that we could build a much healthier food system for ourselves and for the rest of the world. And it's very, very simple. If we change dinner, we change health, and we change the world. Thank you. <laughs>